So uh, my name is Karen Meyer. I work for NEO and I'm very pleased to talk about one of my favorite things, which is uh, flying robots and robots in general and closure. So uh, I like to, in, in most of my talks, incorporate a story into my talks. And um, this actually begins with a story. And if I can get my clicker to work, ah. This story takes place a long time ago. So just get your mindset, it was a long time ago. Way before mobile phones, way before personal computers, I know, ancient. But in this time, there was an ordinary girl, a completely ordinary five-year-old girl, until one day when she saw an episode of Sesame Street. And on this episode of Sesame Street, there was this robot called Sam. So Sam the robot on Sesame Street, his name actually stands for Super Automatic Machine. And this girl was completely taken by this robot. She just loved this robot. That's all she could think about. And she, she really, what she really wanted is she wanted this robot to be her robot friend. And so after she saw this, like I said, that's all she could talk about. She, she stopped playing with dolls. Uh, she stopped playing with her stuffed animals. She even stopped playing with the dog. And her parents were getting a little bit concerned about this. I mean, they wanted to make her child happy, their child happy. What could they do? I mean, they couldn't just go out to the store like you could do, go today and buy a robot or a uh, tech toy. Um, so they, being kind and loving parents, they did the best that they could at the time, which is they built her a robot made of wood. So it had a wooden head and a simple wooden body, and it had little wheels for feet so you could drag it along. But it wasn't just a plain model of a robot. It could actually do something. It could only do one thing, but it did it really well. It had a magnet on the bottom, so you could spread nails out over the floor and then drag the robot over it, and it would magically pick things up. And the girl loved it. She thought this was fantastic, the best thing ever. This was her robot friend, and she would drag it with her everywhere. She would drag it all around the house. It came with her to the grocery stores. It went with her to the libraries everywhere, and she loved it. The years passed. She grew up. She became a software developer. She worked for large and small companies. She programmed in many different languages, and she even had kids of her own. And she turned into me. So I had totally forgotten about my wooden robot friend of my childhood until one day I saw this. It was a Roomba. And you could hack it. You could control it. And there was something about seeing the way that it scooted around the floor and sucked stuff up that just brought back those childhood memories of my robot that picked up nails. So I thought I needed to have this, and I needed to program it. And it could be my robot friend. So first, if I'm going to program it and hack it, how do you talk to a robot? Well, I figured if robots have a natural first language, it really had to be in Lisp. Because Lisp is one of the first languages that were used to program AI in. And actually, it was invented by what we call the father of AI, um, John McCarthy. But being a modern woman, I want the modern conveniences along with this Lisp. So I chose to, do, to talk to my robot in Clojure. And Clojure is a modern Lisp. It runs on the JVM. So it has all the advantages of running in a tried and true JVM language. And it can talk to all the other Java classes. We'll go a little bit more into that later. So uh, about Java. It is a dynamic language. So being dynamic is that you don't have to declare the types of things. If I want to define a cat um, being a string, I didn't need to say that's a type of a string. I just say def cat. And um, this is what you get the output. You get a cat. 
It is a functional language. So this is a quick look at how you declare functions in Clojure. You have to define a function here. Here's a function's name. Say hello. Here's a parameter. You take in the name. And what we're going to do is concatenate with whatever we pass in the name with hello. So that's a function. And here's how you call it. You um, call say hello Roomba, and it'll output this string, hello Roomba. So about pure functions, um, pure functions, as you know, if you put in the same um, input, you get out the same output for a pure function. There are no side effects. So those are pure functions. And there are purely functional languages. And then there are impure languages. And Clojure is an impure language. So it does have side effects and embraces side effects. But it does it in a systematic, sensible fashion. So um, it also has Java interop. So if you look at what this is, this Roomba string, and look at the class of it, under the covers, it's just a Java Lang string. So it truly is, you know, embraces Java. It has wrapper-free wrap access to all the methods that Java has. So um, Java has a method on it for strings to uppercase. So you can call that to uppercase on Roomba and make it be Roomba, uppercase. Concurrency, which is really one of its strong points. All its data structures are immutable. And um, it has these other things called vars, refs, atoms, and agents that I'm not going to go all into. But um, it allows it to handle concurrency and, <laughs> and multi-threading very nicely. So back to our Roomba. Um, the Roomba is made by iRobot. And they have an open interface that you can talk to it on the serial command interface. And um, I'm going to talk to it. Let me show you the. OK. Behold the Roomba. It's got an SCI port right here. So that's where we can talk to it with the serial port. But we're going to um, I'll put it on the camera, too. We are going to talk to it with a Bluetooth, which is a Bluetooth device that plugs into it. And we're also going to be using an existing Java library written for this called RoombaCom. But we're going to talk to it in Clojure. So we're really going to show the Java interop. So I'm going to exit out of here for a minute. OK. So the first thing I need to do is connect up the Bluetooth. So we go to Bluetooth. And we find the Bluetooth device. And we update services. And it's connected. Yay. So I have Emacs open here. And I can execute things as I click in um, Emacs. So actually, I'm in the wrong buffer here. I want the Roomba simple. OK, so we define our Roomba. We are going to see what name it's giving it. I think it's 4, so this should be good. And we're going to try to connect to it. Come on. Yay, we connected. So we'll start up. And let me get my. Let me make sure I can talk to it, and then I'll get a camera set on it so you guys can see it. All right, it's singing to me. It's ready. OK, it's kind of dark there, but um, there's a camera there showing the Roomba on the floor. So hopefully, you guys will be able to see it as we go along here. So um, I just made it play a note. It's kind of soft. But a little higher note. And I'm going to make it spin left now. OK? You see it spinning? Yay! And we'll spin right. And he's spinning right. And we can tell him to stop. And we can tell him to vacuum. And tell him to stop vacuuming. 
You can also get a hold of the sensor data. I'm not going to do that right now, but you can define functions in Clojure. So I can define a function called spin and beep. And I can execute it. So now he'll spin and beep. So it's kind of hard to see, but he beeped three times and turned around. All right. Good Roomba. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. Let's go back to here. Okay, we saw the Roomba demo. Um, I can just play this real quick for the people that couldn't see in the back. So this is in better lighting circumstances of, um, of us controlling it and making it do things. So it's a lot of fun, it really is. And it cleans your kids' rooms. I have my, each of my kids have a Roomba and they have to keep their stuff picked up off the floor. It's fabulous, it's great, I highly recommend it. So there's a video of controlling it. So great fun. So Roomba and I had wonderful times um, spending it together, hacking, and cleaning the house. And then one day, I saw this. <laughs> and my eyes just lit up. <laughs> this is an AR drone, and it's seriously cool. And I thought, wow, I want this to be my robot friend. So a little bit about the AR drone. Here it is here. Oops. So it's a quadcopter. It's got, and oh, there's a front here. It's got two cameras. It's got one in the front, one in the bottom. And it's also got sonar. Out of the box, it um, flies just via your iPhone or iPad. It's got an application. So it's super easy to just get going and fly and have some fun. But it's also got a API that you can write and control programs for. So, and this is the AR drone developer guide it comes with. So it has great documentation to show you how you can communicate with it and control it. So uh, the communication, it's actually got, runs its own wireless network in there. And it communicates via UDP. So I'm just gonna go through a very simple base how you would give a communication to the drone. So this very first line here is just importing some basic Java UDP libraries. Um, I'm also defining a drone host, which is a default IP and a default port to connect to, and uh, defining some more UDP stuff. So this is a function that just sends a command, uh, a bytes, to this UDP connection. So it's very simple. Um, so now here's the meat of it. Here's our commands. This is how you would tell it to take off and land. I'm going to get here. So this atref is kind of the command class that you would call, and it's in the documentation. This one and this two before this comma is a sequence number, and that's kind of an important bit because if you send it something that doesn't increment, um, it won't listen to it. So it's got to listen to a sequence command higher than the one it listened to before. It's okay if you miss some, but <laughs> it's got to increase. And this is encoded uh, in the documentation, um, telling it some information of how to fly. So basically, all you do is to send it the string. So you do send command, take off, and it'll take off, and send command and land, and it will land. So the first time I did this, I was messing around with it in my REPL at the kitchen table. And I actually screamed because I did not expect it to take off, and it did take off. And it was nine o'clock at night, and the kids came running out of the room saying, "Mommy, mommy, what's the matter?" I'm like, "It worked! It worked! Look, this thing's flying! It's great!" So um, on this, I, I wanted to actually write a library for it. So I started writing a library for it called CLJ Drown, and had great fun in doing it. Um, so there's a lot more commands that you can do in it as well. You can take off. You can land. Um, emergency is what happens when you tilt it or it gets into trouble. You have to say it's okay. You can go again, but it shuts down otherwise. 
um, spin right, spin left. You can go up, down. You can tilt front, tilt back. I do this a lot when I'm talking about drones because it's like tilt, 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 tilt. You know, the roll pitch, y'all, you know, all that. So um, hover, you can fly. Flat trim is when you tell it to kind of calibrate. You're on the ground flat and, and uh, telling it that you are flat so it can take care of itself. Reset watchdog. <laughs> Reset watchdog is um, you have to keep up a current communication with the drone, and if it doesn't hear from you in a certain amount of time, it goes, oh, you know, we were timing out, you got to reinitiate your whole protocol again. But if you send it a reset watchdog, you say, oh, I'm not sending you something right now, but it's okay. So it keeps up the communication pro protocol. So, and that's how you call them, say drone take off. So um, let's go ahead and look at a demo. All right. So just opening up the drone here, this is its indoor hull. It has an outdoor hull too, but this is an indoor hull which saves it from bumping into things and its blades, which is very useful. Oh, we'll also do drone safety tips here. So for some reason, you see the drone going somewhere, you just grab it um, by the front. Oops. So you can grab it by the front like this or the back and just tilt it. So if you tilt it up, it'll go into its emerg emergency mode. So it should be fine, but just letting know. If the Roomba comes at you, you, you step over it, OK? <laughs> All right. So we're good at that. So I have to plug in the battery. OK. So you'll see that he's kind of turning on here. Um, he's going to raise up here in a minute, so you guys will be able to see if everything goes well. We'll see. If not, we have backup video, so we're good. We're covered. OK. Well, this is a little bit, because I need to get to my internet wireless thing, which is a little dicey. Because I can't see my, my wireless connection. Is it system preferences? Can I get to my wireless here? I usually get to it just at the top. Uh, network. So Wi Fi. Ah. Join. Shouldn't it just show up? Oh, there he is. So this is the Air Drone Wireless Network. So we're going to go ahead and join it. And hope that it, yay, we're connected. Hoorah. OK. So we're going to switch to drone moves. So you do live coding with hardware, and you're just crazy. But we're doing it anyway. So we initialize, and we're going to take off. All right, he's moving a little bit close there. Oh, no. There. <laughs> Three. Tell him to hover. Hover. OK, I'll tell him to hover. All right. Land. Okay, we'll try one more time. I put some tape down here on the floor. Usually, sometimes if it's like a featureless landscape, he tries, the cameras try to lock on something to know where to stay in one place. And if he can't see that, he gets into trouble. So we'll try one more time. So. All right, that's good. We're going to try a wave here. Okay, we'll try this other animation here. <laughs> so you can have some great fun with this. So I'm going to go ahead and land him now before he gets into trouble. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's great. It's great fun. You want to just? Do you want the battery out, or are you going to? Um, yeah, let's just leave the battery in because I'm going to use them just we'll in a minute. Right yeah.
All right. Where'd my thing go? So I had a backup video, but we're not going to do it. OK. So navigation data, not only can you give it commands, you can also get um, all the sensor data. And it's got tons of sensor data that you can get a hold of. So I have gotten the sensor data off of the drone where it's streaming it. And I've saved it into this closure structure. It's called an atom called nav data. And this is where you could use to uh, save off data and share it across multiple threads. So some of the example of um, data that I'm gathering in here, you can know the control state. So it knows whether it's flying or it's landed or it's hovering. Uh, it knows its battery percentage. It knows its pitch, roll, yaw, altitude, velocity x, velocity y, velocity z. And it can also detect, pre-detect uh, these things called tags or um, targets. But so it'll recognize this is called an oriented roundel. Rondel. So it can tell you if it's detected this, it can tell you how far away from it it is, and it can tell you the orientation of itself to this. So it'll know what degrees angle that it's off from this. This is the oriented rondel. It can also detect, um, it can also detect tags on other AR drones. So it detects the hull and it detects these stickers. So this is what it was meant um, to do, so that you can play games and program games for other AR drones, and you can fly with each other. Kind of make um, AR stands for augmented reality. So, so this is an example of a program using it. So. Um, what I'm doing here is I am logging the things I'm interested out of the nav data. And we initialize a drone. And this is, tells it that we're going to start looking for these vision tags. And we're going to look for uh, them on, we're going to look for the, horizon, the horizontal shell, uh, the horizontal camera. We're going to look for the drone shells. And then uh, we're going to look for the blue tags rather than some drones have like green or yellow. And then on the vertical camera, we're going to look for the, that rondel that I just showed you. And um, here, when you knit the nav data, then it'll start streaming it. So it's pretty cool. It's water here. So I had a really good time with this. But I felt that there was still something missing. I mean, after all, this is my robot friend, you know? And I, I thought my robot friend needed some beliefs and goals. <laughs> and this is not such a crazy concept, because uh, John McCarthy came up with a, a paper a while back in 1979 ascribing mental qualities in machines, <laughs> in which he thought that it was sensible under some circumstances to ascribe beliefs and goals to machines. And in fact, he has a classic example in there of a thermostat. So a thermostat can be ascribed beliefs and goals. Not many, but some. And in fact, it can only have three beliefs. It believes the room is too hot. It can believe the room is too cold. And it can believe the room is just right. And it has one goal. The room should be just right. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, if you think about it, maybe it would make things easier to understand and reason about it. Uh, if you have a very complex system and many bits of state going on, maybe it would be easier for us as programmers and developers to describe that in a sent sentence that could be a belief. And maybe if we think about this uh, at, in a long enough time or after a while, it might help us build intelligent systems. Um, you know, thinking about them as having their own beliefs and goals, and we could relate to them how we relate to maybe other humans. So let's kind of try this. So we're making something called a belief action. So the drone has a belief action that it's landed. So there's a sentence that describes it. I am landed. And it will hold this belief if this evaluates to true. So if it looks at its navigation data and sees that it's landed, it will hold the belief I'm landed. 
and it can also take an action. So if it believes that it's landed, it's going to go ahead and take off. It has another belief action taking off. Um, it believes it's taking off if it's in this control state trans takeoff that is gets to before you get to hover. And in this case, we're not going to do anything. And then we can define a goal based on these belief actions. We can say um, it can have a goal, I want to fly. And we can achieve this goal if it gets to the hub control state hovering. And it can take these two belief actions. And it can also have multiple goals. So uh, in this case, I want it to have a goal take off. I want it to do, get to a cruising altitude and then to land. So let's see it. All right. OK, I have a log file here that we'll look at in just a minute. Get the right file. Move this over a bit now. Okay, I'm going to evaluate the whole buffer and get everything in there. So it's got some goals. And I'm going to uncomment the part out where we're going to initialize it again. And we're going to initialize the nav stream. And once we initialize this um, nav stream, it should start looking at its navigation data and engage its goals and beliefs. And it's not doing it. Oh, no. OK. We'll try one more time. Initialize. Hmm. And something, of course, went terribly wrong. Try one more time and then we'll give up and I'll show you the backup video. It does have goals. Do you think we should unplug it and replug it in? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Oh, yeah, the lights are red on it. Maybe I should just do drone emergency. Hold on. Drone emergency. Ah, we've got green lights now. OK. <laughs> it's OK. All right. So initialize and then nav data. Yes. OK, he's going to get up to a cruising altitude. Unless he runs into the wall, and then he'll. <laughs> this is Jim, my drone wrangler. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, so if you look at the log file here, um, you can see some of his beliefs and goals. So, there you go. So he's got a goal list. He's got his current goal. Um, so actually, he's got his current belief right there is none. But anyway, you get the idea. So he's flying with goals and beliefs. Uh, oh, there's my code. All right, just a side note. Jim also has a drone in the office. So we have great fun during lunchtime playing with these things. And Jim has written a library, too. He's written his library in, in uh, Ruby. And so mine's in Clojure. So we have, we have a lot of fun playing with both of them. So here's our backup video. I think we saw enough, but you, you, get, you get the idea. It's, it's, uh, it's good fun. OK, so we have the Roomba. And the Roomba's my friend. And I have the AR drone. And the AR drone's my friend. But wouldn't it be cool if we could get them to be friends together? You know, it would kind of be like Wally. <laughs> it would be so cool. So I, I wanted them to be friends 
together. So I, I worked on a program where they could both do something together. And there's not enough space um, to do this today, which makes you sad. I kind of need more space. But I'll describe it to you. So this, this rondel is um, the thing that the drone recognizes, right? See, he can recognize this. So the idea is that they would start in different corners and the Roomba would go towards the drone. Meanwhile, the drone would be circling, trying to find the Roomba, and then finally he would lock on. And because of the closure shared state concurrency, the Roomba would know when the drone saw him and he would stop and sing a happy song. In fact, sing the, um, the theme from Wally. -E. And then the lights would flash, and then the, um, the drone's got a built-in mode where it, can, the, where it can follow this rondel. So the Roomba would be going around and around like this, and the drone would be hovering and following it. And I wish I could show it to you in real life, but we just don't have enough space here. But I will show you on a video. So here we go. So this is actually in our Neo office where we have tape all over the floor here. Oh, so, so you see, there goes the drone. And he's starting to circle. And he's locked on now. Oh, sorry, circling still. He isn't quite locked on yet. Oh, he's locked on now. So the room is turning around, the drone's following him. And if you listen here in a minute, you hear the song. If I can turn up some. Can you hear that kind of? Okay, so he's playing the Wally song there. It's kind of hard to hear. And so they dance together and spin around and follow each other. And then he nails a landing. So, and, and this took a lot <laughs> to get working. And in fact, the uh, help of, uh, of my colleagues here at NEO. So we had a lot of fun doing it too. So to recap, robots are great fun to program and play with. Uh, Closure is a simple yet powerful language. And it's perfect for trying to do AI stuff with. And ascribing beliefs and goals um, to machines can be useful. I've found it uh, that I, when something goes wrong, for example, the drone, I told it to go up, and then he just kept going up and bumped into the ceiling. And I looked at it and said, well, what was he believing? What, 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 was, what was wrong? He obviously had a faulty belief there. And you know, this me and my greater than less sense sign, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> it did help in debugging. So, and robots communicating and acting together, I think, is a future. You know, we've made great strides in technology. You've got Roombas, you've got drones, we've got all sorts of other machines going on. And getting them to talk and work together, I think, is one of our um, great, exciting opportunities for the future. So, uh, resources, if you want to see more, I've got my library. Um, CLJ Drone is out on GitHub. Um, Jim has a Ruby library called Argus that is also out on GitHub. Uh, there's uh, CLJ Roomba, which is an example project for talking to the Roomba. And uh, John McCarthy's papers, they're available on the internet and I would highly recommend reading them. They're very thought-provoking, even after all these years. Lots of good stuff. And that's it. <laughs> so any questions? Oh, good question. They only last about 15 minutes of, of flight time, like you're flying it all the time. Uh, the Roomba has, it goes back to its recharging dock. It's very smart. You can find its recharging dock. So, um, but the Roomba is probably about, I don't know, an hour or so. So the battery is much better on this. But these batteries are really tiny. I'll show you. So I, I usually have a couple that I carry around with. And it's got a charger that is somewhere in my bag, but it just plugs into the outlet and charges it. So.
Any other questions? Yeah? Do the police represent state enclosure for the, the uh, AR? Uh, the, the beliefs do represent a state as I implemented it, right? Uh, so it could be a very complex state, but uh, that's how I'm describing its belief is its current state of the system, whatever it is. For example, my belief is it's a nice day outside if it's sunny and it's 70. So that's kind of my belief of a state representation. So that's the kind of model I was going after. Yes? How much extra weight can the drone handle in your fly? I have not experimented with that. I don't know. Jim, have you experimented with that? Uh, not much. These are, if you, if you pick this up, you will be surprised at how light the drone actually is. And it will not carry a whole lot of extra weight. In other words, you're not going to see this delivering tacos or uh, cans of beer to you, uh, to the drone. Uh, the Roomba was probably more, more reliable for that. Yeah. Uh, but they can lift small, lightweight things, and uh, you can mount them on the, the drone and carry them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have not, but that's an interesting thing to do. Maybe not on the drone so much, because it's so light. I don't know if it could take a Raspberry Pi. But um, definitely, people have done a lot of uh, stuff with um, the Roombas and other robots, with Arduinos, obviously, and Raspberry Pis. If, if I can jump sure. in yeah. here, because I actually have tried this a little bit. I've not done anything practical with it yet. But I have put a DigiSpark on my drone. And a DigiSpark is an Arduino that's about the size of a quarter. And it's powered off the USB. There's a USB port on the drone itself. And it will power a DigiSpark. And so my goal is to put some extra sensors on the drone uh, for better positioning information, run it uh, through the DigiSpark, then talk to it over the USB port on the drone. There you go. This is why lunch times are so fun around our office. Yes? Apart from being fun, what did you learn from this? What I learned from this, um, I think it was a good, uh, I would have been kind of looking at McCarthy's papers, and it was a good tangible, uh, thing to kind of explore some of his ideas with the goals and beliefs. And uh, I think that's always a useful thing to learn and, and, you know, teach yourself about that. And also just trying to do anything practical or have a goal with a language is a great way to learn language, right? Because you wanted to do this and then you run into problems, of course, and then you've got to learn how to solve your problems and that's how you learn. So I highly recommend having a project, setting yourself, you know, something. Uh, you know, my, my next overly ambitious goal is I would like to have the, the drone fly up and be able to tell the Roomba where M&Ms are to suck them up, right? So, <laughs> so you know, there's all sorts of stuff that I need to learn and um, be able to accomplish to be able to do this. So it's kind of, yes? I don't know exactly. I've been a little cautious in testing it out because I've heard stories of people that are flying it outside and they tell the Roomba to go like this direction and it goes and it just loses Wi-Fi and then it just keeps on going and you can't control it anymore. So I, you know, I kind of baby, I'm like a helicopter parent to my drone, so I haven't really, really done that, but yes. Oh, when you go like this? I think it just goes, keeps on going from what I've heard from people. <laughs> there, there's some awesome yeah. videos on YouTube of people who've lost their drones and then recovered them later and, and can get the video off of them. So, so Google around for AR drones and there's some really interesting videos out there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we have flown the drones in our office all the way down the hallway, which I don't mm -hmm. know, several hundred feet away. Yeah. And we, so indoors, we have no problems with Wi-Fi signal, mm -hmm. uh, and we've not done a whole lot of outdoor experimentation. Oh, does it? Oh, nice. So track back to its landing zone. Okay, so if people didn't hear that, he said the new firmware has a return to home on it. So that, that needs a GPS model, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so that would be very exciting. Uh, yeah, I think it's an aftermarket you can add on to. It. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I don't think they're selling it yet. Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm waiting for that to come mm -hmm. out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be very nice. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome to come down here and uh, look at the drone and Roomba on your way out or whatever. So thanks a lot. <laughs>